You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Hello, and welcome to Comrades in Arms, North Korea and Syria, featuring Dr. Samuel Romani of the University of Oxford and moderated by Mr. Ross Tokola of the East West Center in Washington. I'm Keith Luce with the National Committee on North Korea, which works to promote principled engagement between the United States and North Korea. Today's webinar is the fourth installment in the NCNK East West Center webinar series on North Korea's foreign relations, past and present. You can find past webinars on the YouTube channels of NCNK or the East West Center, and you may sign up for the final two upcoming webinars in the series on either website. I'd also encourage you to check out NorthKoreaInTheWorld.org, a website jointly run by NCNK and the East West Center that showcases a broad collection of information on North Korea's foreign trade and diplomatic relations. We're very pleased to have Dr. Sammy Romani with us today to discuss historical and contemporary developments in the Syria-North Korea relationship. Dr. Romani recently completed his doctorate in international relations at the University of Oxford, where he is currently a politics and international relations tutor. We're also pleased to have Ross Tokola from the East-West Center to moderate today's discussion and to further introduce Dr. Romani. Ross is the executive associate to the director at the East-West Center here in Washington, where he gives advice and support to the director on ongoing near-term and long-term strategic projects and programs. Previously, he was a program officer at the Assan Institute for Policy Studies during his five years in Seoul and has worked for the US embassies, both in the Republic of Korea and in the United Kingdom. Before we get started, let me encourage the members of the audience to submit questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ross. Thank you. Uh, Keith, thank you. As always, it's a pleasure for us at the East West Center to be partnering with you and with your team at NCNK, both on North Korea and the world and on this webinar series. So again, thanks. And before I turn it over to Dr. Romani, I'll share a bit more of his background. Uh, Dr. Romani is a regular contributor to Foreign Policy Magazine and to think tanks such as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Middle East Institute. He has written extensively about North Korean foreign and security policy for The Diplomat, The Washington Post, and 38 North. He has briefed and advised the NATO Intelligence Fusion Center, the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.K. Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and France's Ministry of Defense on security issues pertaining to Russia, Afghanistan, and to North Korea. His first book on Russia's contemporary policy towards Africa will be published by Oxford University Press and by Hearst Publishers in early 2022. So I encourage you all to look out for that book in the new year. Uh, with that, Dr. Romani, uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ross. Yeah, so just a few, uh, should, I, should I start with a few preliminary comments about the North Korea Syria relationship or should we just engage with Q&A? What do you suggest? Oh, please, uh, your comments first, by all means. Okay, yeah, so uh, North Korea's relationship with Syria is one of the longest and most enduring partnerships that North Korea has possessed in the third world. And it's akin to Cuba, and it's akin to uh, Iran, at least since 1979, and some others as well. So it's a partnership that's lasted for almost five decades in the making, which is quite a striking uh, comparison because Syria is a secular authoritarian Arab state of socialist orientation. North Korea is a Marxist Leninist country. Ideologically, in terms of the character of their regimes, aside from their anti-Americanism and anti-Westernism, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot that they have in common. But this relationship has really endured over a long period of time. And now uh, we can get into the historical phases a little more, but now when we're looking at the more contemporary North Korea-Syria relationship, I think there's, some, there's several trends that I think we need to pay attention to. The first is North Korea's ongoing military support for the uh, Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria. And that has included the Chamba 1 and Chamba 2 uh, brigades that were deployed to Syria uh, in order to assist uh, Assad's campaigns in Aleppo and recapturing rebel-held areas. The, that ground support has also been enriched by periodic North Korean 
support for Syrian missile defense technology, offensive missile technology, and chemical weapons. So there's a long feature of, of military and security cooperation that's highly unregulated and highly clandestine that we should be paying a lot of attention to. Moreover, the North Korean relationship in the security sphere with Syria fits into a broader umbrella of support for Iran and aligned proxy and militia groups throughout the Middle East, whether that be the construction of tunnels for Hamas, support for Hezbollah, uh, the movement of Sky missiles to the Houthi rebels in Yemen. This is uh, a nexus that we need to look at and Syrian arms dealers play an important role in facilitating that nexus. So from a security perspective, this is something that's of vital importance to American policymakers, particularly focused on Middle Eastern security. Looking ahead to the post pandemic, and as the Syrian war winds down, we have constitutional negotiations that we progress towards a reconstruction. I see the North Korean Syria partnership enduring and extending on its past trends. In particular, Bashar al Assad noted in 2018 that he'd be interested in making a state visit to Pyongyang. So if that happens, that could lead to more interactions. North Korean uh, guest workers have continued to work in Syria, particularly in the construction sector, in spite of repeated warnings from the UN panel of experts and uh, sanctions that are imposed on both countries, the Caesar Act on Syria and the multilateral UN sanctions on North Korea. That cooperation could take shape. And as we enter the reconstruction phase, moreover, I see North Korea acting as a proxy or a surrogate that does Iran and Russia's bidding in Syria and does it in a deniable fashion. I think that North Korea could emerge as a third party that assists security sector reform within Syria as the Russians and the Iranians uh, both are trying to influence the uh, security sector reform process by exerting leverage over Assad. The Syrians might want to have a purely transactional partner in this sphere to help them, and North Korea would be a good partner for that. And also, I see North Korea really just uh, the sending workers and expressing solidarity and continuing this uh, broader struggle against American uh, hegemonism, new imperialism, and uh, uh, unilateral sanctions. So I see a half a century long relationship that seems to be between two very disparate countries continuing and blossoming in the post-pandemic era. So now that I've just given a brief context and a look forward, I'm happy to start the discussion with Ross and uh, deal with more specific questions. Well, thank you so much for getting us started. I appreciate it. And I'll just remind our guests that if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat and the Q&A. So a lot of rich material to start unpacking, uh, just to start us off. Uh, North Korea and Syria have been close partners, especially close since the 1973 war. Uh, right. What explains the endurance of the Pyongyang-Damascus relationship? So the North Korean-Syrian relationship obviously should not be viewed in isolation. It should be viewed within the broader struggle uh, against uh, anti-imperialism and anti-Zionism, which much like the Soviet Union had argued, Zionism is a form of imperialism. The Syrians and the North Koreans saw this uh, very much uh, uh, as their policy too. And North Korea established fairly close ties with many of the Arab nationalist countries of the Middle East. So Egypt under Nasser was, was one of their first recipients of Scud missile systems, Iraq under the Ba'ath Party and Syria. And in spite of all the disagreements between those three countries, uh, because Nasser and Iraq were rivals for the, uh, the Arab nationalist ma leadership mantle, the uh, Iraqi and Syrian Ba'ath Party certainly had no love lost between them for, for most of their existences. North Korea was a convenient and amenable partner to all of them. And it, it first of all began in 1973 with the uh, training of, uh, of pilots for the Egyptians and also running of MIG-21s, which fought Israeli F-4s right in the middle of the, uh, of the front. And uh, that military cooperation in 1973, that support for Arab nationalism, that belief that Zionism was a form of imperialism really led to the blossoming of the relationship in the decades that followed. So in 1974, Hafez Assad returned the favor of North Korea's support for Syria by visiting Pyongyang. And the relationship also became something that was more of a cross-generational one and more of a systemic one in the 1980s, when the Kim Il-sung Military Academy began training uh, Syrian cadets. Kim Jong-il was personally supervising this. So this kind of brought it from a Kim Il-sung, Hafez Assad bond and a partnership into an Assad family, Kim Dynasty partnership that persisted. And then in 1990, 1991, obviously, this was at a crossroads because we were uncertain about the survival of the North Korean regime after the end of the Cold War. And Syria was also showing some uh, fledgling signs of abandoning or at least softening some of its anti-Western posturing by backing the United States in the 1991 Gulf War. 
But the, uh, the, the Syrians and the North Korean partnership uh, survived once again with the supply of 24 Skype launchers and mobile launchers in 1991, right as the Syrians were engaging with the United States on, on, on the Gulf crisis. And the Israelis and the North Koreans were also holding clandestine interactions at that moment in time. And over the past three decades, you've really seen the relationship blossom in a variety of spheres. In 1997, uh, there were two testimonies from the North Korean uh, Ministry of, Affair, of Foreign Affairs defectors to the US Congress, which revealed that uh, of the $1 billion in revenues that North Korea was getting from missiles, mostly in the MENA region, Syria was one of their core clients, along with Egypt, Libya, and Iran. So Syria was an important client in the missile sphere. That also extended to nuclear cooperation with the uh, construction of a nuclear reactor that was modeled after Yongbyon, and that was destroyed by uh, Israeli strikes in uh, 2007. And then with the advent of the Syrian civil war, the uh, historic loyalty between the Assad and Kim families between Pyongyang and Damascus really blossomed further. North Korea has even served as election observers in the 2014 Syrian elections to rubber stamp Assad's legitimacy, a lot of symbolic exchanges of support, some of the military brigade and chemical weapons assistance that I mentioned. And looking forward to the reconstruction sphere, as I noted before, this partnership is going to not be going away, as probably going to be expanding and developing in many interesting new directions. Hmm. We had a question right from the beginning from one of our guests who was asking in what way Syria is benefiting from North Korea's support. Uh, could you speak to how impactful that North Korean military support has been like, on balance? Has it been significant? Has it been compared to well, other so support they've been say, receiving? Oh yeah, so, I, so what I would say is that North Korea is uh, its support for Syria has been fairly consistent and it's also been uh, clandestine and very easily deniable. So it's been involved, for example, in supplying uh, chemical weapons, uh, material and equipment to the Syrians by our relationships between COMED and the Syrian chemical weapons arsenal after 2013. So when the Russians had claimed that the Syrian chemical weapons problem was gone and uh, that they had completely disarmed, the Russians could not be seen as aiding or abetting that program. The Chinese have gotten into hot water too for selling uh, chlorine gas and other products that would have resembled it. So when they wanted to get uh, chemical weapons parts, gas masks, other equipment, the North Koreans were able to fill in in a clandestine fashion and, and, and set that up. And from 2012 to 2017, there were uh, about an estimated 40 shipments according to the uh, UN panel of experts that uh, came in terms of chemical weapons support and uh, missile support. So North Korea has been a deniable and a convenient partner, particularly in the chemical weapons sphere when Russia and China, even that was a bridge too far for them in their support for Assad. So that's been significant. I think that North Korean technical assistance has been valuable in Syria, much like it's been valuable to other countries in the former third world. So uh, they took some of the training that they did, they used with the 5th Brigade in Zimbabwe, with uh, Joseph Kabila's armies in Congo, and many other counterinsurgency settings in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, transferred some of that knowledge and that experience over towards the Syrian front because uh, they, and that was helpful for them in particular in Al Khuzair, I think in the May 2013 offensive, that was North Korean military support was especially prominent and that was especially useful. North Korean air defense and air support has also continued. So the training of pilots, which began in 1973 has continued more than 40 years later and they've worked mm -hmm. together. The North Koreans deny that, but that's another vector that we've seen them get involved in. And I think that the, uh, Obviously, this uh, unregulated supply of North Korean weapons has caused some problems. So some of the man pads and some of the systems managed to get into the hands of ISIS in 2014 after ISIS took over those territories. But North Korea helped the Syrians on the ground against ISIS and kind of almost repaid and patched up that problem. And I think on the outskirts of Damascus and Aleppo, they also played an important role. But after 2016, you start seeing the North Korean military role dissipate. So I think in terms of deniable chemical weapons and missile defense technology, that al Qaeda offensive, repairing the damage of there's all this arms proliferation reaching ISIS and kind of putting the toothpaste back in the tube, if you will, and the Chama 1 and Chama 7's responsibilities with respect to uh, uh, Aleppo and the Damascus escorts. Those would be the three or four areas where North Korea has practically helped the Syrian military. Thank you. And staying on the civil war a little bit longer, um, how is North Korea's alignment with Assad during the Syrian civil war strengthened its relationship with Iran and Russia. And there are already some questions in the Q&A about uh, 
chemical weapon supplies from for, of DPRK, were they of Russian origin? There's a lot of interest in this nexus. Oh yeah, definitely. This is a very interesting nexus. So uh, obviously uh, North Korea has spent a lot of attention cultivating its relationship with Iran ever since pretty much the 1979 revolution. The uh, Iran-Iraq war, North Korea was one of the few countries in the international community that was overtly on Iran's side. So they did rankle the Iranians a little bit when in September of 1982, they did accept a meeting from an Iraqi delegation as well. That was right at the time when the Iranians and the Iraqis were trying to come up with the ceasefire. But for almost 40 years, the North Koreans have been a very reliable partner of Iran, and that's been in the missile defense sphere and in the more military sphere, at least since 1985. So this builds on an established partnership that North Korea has with Iran. And as Iran's uh, for forms of uh, coercion and uh, its military tactics rely a lot more on proxies rather than on its conventional army, so its reliance on Hezbollah, its reliance on the Houthis, its reliance on Assad, North Korea has aided and assisted the, uh, the Iranian military objectives wherever it can, whether it be the supply of uh, low-grade war material to the Houthis and, uh, and Hezbollah, and also th uh, through the, uh, the support of Syrian objectives. I also think that the North Korean relationships with the uh, military intelligence wings that, that Iran has, North Korea and Iran have very similar links within the intelligence services too. The links that Russia has are a little bit more on some of the uh, are more reformist ends of the Syrian security sector. So the Syrian military, Syrian military intelligence has got a bit of a de facto division between hardliners who are resistant to security sector reform and those who are more amenable to it. The Iranians and the North Koreans seem to pair up more closely in terms of their person-to-person -person alliances within the Syrian intelligence directorate. So that's another uh, note I want to make. So this is part of right, North Korea's broader support for Iran's axis of resistance activities and Iran's proxy wars for the past uh, 40 years. With respect to Russia and Syria, the relationship is a lot more uh, opaque and it's a lot harder to decipher. I would say that some of North Korea's chemical weapons assistance has certainly taken Russia off the hook and it's given them a deniable point of access. Some of North Korea's participation in construction projects, particularly if those extend also to phosphate and energy, which are areas where the Russians have signed a lot of preliminary reconstruction deals with the Syrian regime, North Korean guest workers could do Russia's in uh, bidding and advance their interests. So I think that North Korea-Russia relations will probably blossom more in the reconstruction sphere. North Korea-Iran relations have already probably peaked in the military sphere. And the reconstruction mm -hmm. sphere, they will only be if Iran outbids Russia on major contracts, which does not seem to be the trend so far. Mm -hmm. I want to pick up on a question from one of the audience members uh, on uh, North Korean laborers overseas. Uh, what is your assessment of how many North Koreans are working now in Syria? And to add to that, how much back and forth is there? How much, so, how much uh, do North Koreans go to Syria and vice versa? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. Obviously, it's uh, hard to know exactly how many uh, North Koreans are living in Syria. What we do know is that in June of 2019, there was a memorandum of understanding that was signed between the Syrian and North Korean foreign ministries that was aimed at bolstering economic relations. And that memorandum also was dealt with the containment of unilateral sanctions. So the Syrians were aware that the Caesar Act or some more expansive form of US sanctions were gonna be in the works. The North Koreans were having their pressure put on them in terms of uh, the expulsion of guest workers. So even the Russians in Siberia where they've been reliant in Vladivostok on all those North Korean guest workers started sending some of them back. North Korean uh, healthcare workers managed to uh, stay in Nigeria and Tanzania and a few African countries, but in general, were pretty much a, a diminished force uh, there. So North Korea was struggling to find places to, to put its guest workers in and to recruit remittances and currency. The Syrians were willing to uh, flout international sanctions and go forth. So we know that there's an institutionalized partnership then, at least to the movement of labor between the Syrians and the North Koreans, that's tied to a broader sanctions busting and economic cooperation agreement. That is what we do know. What we don't really know all that much is the specifics in terms of numbers. So an August 2020 UN panel of experts report suggests that 800 North Korean military personnel and laborers had arrived in Syria. But all of those arrivals appear to be traced between June of 2019 and January of 2020. So before the coronavirus pandemic and the when the UN had asked the Syrians to kind of account for this and defend this, the Syrians kind of ignored the UN requests and kind of didn't want to didn't want to talk about it. 
it's hard to know whether actually there were new workers that entered after the December 22nd, 20, 2019 deadline for the repatriation of all North Korean guest workers or whether these were, or whether some of the workers went back. So what all we, all we really know is that between June and December, there were 800 workers that were there and it's in the pandemic era, it's hard to measure something more precise. But given the fact that, that memorandum exists and that agreement exists, I think we'll probably be seeing more coming in with the reconstruction phase. I see, and if on, on agreements and travel between uh, North Korea and the region, there's a question from our partner, Keith Luce. Uh, he writes, Israeli officials, reportedly Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Mossad, visited Pyongyang in 1992. Was the goal to reach an agreement between the two countries which would deter the Syria relationship with North Korea? That's a great question. I would say that absolutely, there was uh, a, a desire more broadly, I think, from the Israelis to uh, get North Korea to start abandoning or softening some of its uh, military alliances with Arab national states and with Iran as well. So uh, the thing was that uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq after the 1991 uh, uh, Gulf War had just become enemy number one in Israel thanks to his threat to burn half of Israel and the throwing of the Scud missiles into Israeli territory. And even though Iraqi North Korean relations had deteriorated since 1982, the fact that Iraq was reaching out to other uh, rogue states like Yugoslavia and uh, that, that were under sanctions, that it didn't have many uh, arms clients or legal partners to work with, meant that that relationship could have come back. So I think the North Korean Iraqi relationship returning and what that might mean for Iraq's chemical weapons programs, biological weapons programs, nuclear ambitions, that may have been at the forefront of uh, is Israel's concerns. Also, uh, almost equivalently at the forefront would have been the expansion of Scud and uh, Iranian North Korean military cooperation uh, in the post-1985 period. Syria, there were those uh, scud transfers that I noted in 91, 92 that were a problem. But I think that Syria was probably a second order priority for the Israelis in terms of uh, dealing with North Korea than the big threats of Iraq and Iran. I think those are probably the primary ones just if you look at uh, national security strategy. Hmm. And there were a lot of divisions certainly within the Israeli uh, government about how to handle this relationship with North Korea. On the one hand, you had Shimon Peres, who was more inclined to support engagement with them. You also had Ben Sur and some others in, the, in Mossad who were willing to acknowledge that the, the, the North Koreans uh, might be able to uh, abandon some of their ties to US adversaries and, and Israeli adversaries if they managed to establish cooperation with Israel. So those yeah, people were in favor of it. Rabin was, however, vehemently against it. So when Perez wanted to visit Pyongyang in January of 1993 and genuinely believed that the North Koreans were going to come around, Rabin yanked the chain on it and pulled it back. So it's an interesting counterfactual. Obviously, if the Israelis and the North Koreans had repaired relations at that time, uh, North Korea, uh, US relations might have taken a different turn with the agreed framework and uh, with, with uh, many of the other nuclear issues that happened after that. But would the North Koreans have abandoned all of their ties to Arab nationalist countries, to Libya, to Iraq, to Iran, to, um, uh, to Egypt, uh, if the Egyptians were getting equipment that the Israelis didn't want, that's harder to say given North Korea's shortage of, of, uh, of hard currency and shortage of trade partners. So I think the deal may have been, in fact, doomed from the beginning in terms of weaning the North Koreans away from the Arab nationalists. But there certainly could have been room for a de-escalation at that time. Oh, it's fascinating. And to stay on Israel a bit longer as well, um, there's a question from Siegfried Hecker. I'll read it out. Why did North Korea help Syria build the plutonium production reactor that Israel bombed? Do you know any details about the arrangements? How much did North Korea supply or intend to supply? Who was the customer for plutonium the reactor would have produced? Who paid for the North Korean help? So plenty of questions there. Well, there's a lot of questions there and it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting. And what I would say is that uh, obviously, if you look at Syrian foreign policy in general, uh, Syria had a bit of a brief uh, resurgence in terms of prospects of cooperation with the West during the 1990s, right? Obviously with the Gulf War and Cl the Clinton administration's long-term goal in the Arab-Israeli normalization talks was to get some kind of Syria-Israel peace agreement. But with Hafez Assad's death and then the obvious sign that Bashar al-Assad's uh, early Damascus spring reforms weren't going anywhere after 2002, those release of political prisoners, nothing really came from that after. Uh, the Cedar Revolution in Lebanon, the assassination of Rafi Kariri, the Syrians were finding themselves in a state of heightened tension with Israel and also heightened isolation from the international community. So they started turning back to some of their older anti-Western partners 
to try to rebuild their relationships. So they struck a debt forgiveness agreement with Russia and they started engaging with North Korea. So it's important to keep in mind that the events of 2007 are heavily related to Syria's uh, heightened sense of vulnerability. It was afraid after the Iraq war, right? That it was going to be the next country in the domino that the Bush administration was gonna overthrow and try to democratize. But, uh, and that those fears just only heightened and grew with the uh, Hariri assassination and its isolation. So Syria was looking for partners and North Korea fit the bill. It's arguable that the expansion of North Korea-Syria relations actually dated back to uh, May of 2005. So almost immediately in tandem with the Zeta revolution with the test firing of, uh, of Scud-B and Scud-D missiles that Syria had for the first time since 2001. And there were rumors and concerns in Israel that the Syrians were gonna get North Korean assistance to be able to deliver airburst chemical weapons. So they were gonna put chemical weapons on a Scud and fire them into uh, Israeli territory. So that was the, a level above what Saddam had been able to do during the Gulf War. And that was a major concern to the Israelis. So that's why I'm noting that that coincidence in time between Syria's isolation in 2005 and their cooperation with the Israelis. Then there were also movements of shipments in terms of propellant blocks and other Scud missile equipment systems that were also moving. So the concern was that in Israel, not that only that North Korea was assisting uh, Israeli uh, Syrian nuclear technology, but that the Syrians were actually trying to get North Korean support to transport that equipment across borders. And that was what explained the Israeli attack on the plutonium reactor. So uh, what we do know is that there were uh, North Korean uh, engineers, North Korean technical assistance that was present at the time. There are some unconfirmed reports that up to 10 uh, North Koreans were actually killed in the Israeli attack on this. The Syrians might not have suspected that this would have happened because the Israelis have not engaged in such a brazen strike of this kind since 1981 in Osirak in Iraq. As we know that the Israelis certainly face a lot of criticism, even from close allies in the West, for what they did then. So it was a bit of a surprise, I think, that it got destroyed. But there were Israeli technical uh, uh, officers there. They were trying to create in Al-Kibar a very similar uh, number of fuel rods, a number of holes in those fuel rods that were just like Yongbyon. They were trying to replicate the Yongbyon reactor. That's what we do now. How much uh, expenses that the Syrians paid to the North Koreans with regards to this, and exactly how many North Korean technicians passed through at any given I'm moment in time in 2005 and 2007, Please try we know less. In a moment. Okay, yeah. So that's kind of what... Uh, that's fascinating, answer. thank you. And it's appropriate with the title of the Comrades in Arms, we're getting some very particular questions about the arms. Uh, here's a one question or a set of questions from uh, Bruce Bechtel. I'm gonna mispronounce the name of this. Um, you said Chalma one and two are still in Syria. Do you have definitive evidence of this? What other advisors are currently in Syria according to your research? At chemical weapons facilities, at ballistic missile facilities, what are the current and ongoing arms sales going to Syria over the past year? Artillery, Type 73 machine guns, weapons refurbishment. And he ends by asking, if this is ongoing, what are your sources? And on top of that, I'd ask a very general question about your sources uh, for all of your research, as you've been talking about clandestine North Korean activities and things they don't, they've been wanting to deny, but you're digging out quite a bit of research. So please. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, break down uh, Bruce's great points here. Uh, with respect to Chalma 1 and Chalma 2 still being in Syria, I, that may have been just a miscommunication on my end or just a misunderstanding. I think that their operations actually uh, diminished significantly to the point in which we have no evidence of them being in existence after 20, uh, 2016. So that's what I was saying. Between 2011 and 2016, during that critical period when Assad was trying to turn the tide on his potential defeat and cap recapture most of Aleppo, that was really the peak of North Korean uh, assistance. So that's what we do now. In terms of the exact number of North Korean military personnel in Syria, the low estimates suggest about 300, the highest estimates suggest about 3,000. So it's very broad and there obviously isn't much knowledge about the exact specifics, but something in that range, if, if that's at all helpful. Um, the uh, North Koreans uh, 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 officers uh, were, were, working, were working in a more of a supervised capacity as well towards the Syrians too because the Korean uh, People's Army had actually participated in 1982 at the crackdown in Hama. And some North Korean officers after that point in time who had a more senior level actually got Arabic language training 
because of their work in Syria and because of their work in Iraq and because of their ties with Egypt. So they were also working in more of an advisory and supervisory level. The number of people who were working on that, we really don't know. But we know that there were some people who were working on the ground as foot soldiers. And we know that there were some people who were working in more of a logistical assistance, advice, and support role. So that's kind of what we really know about the North Korean role in, uh, in Syria and also how that might extend towards um, the, the, their cooperation in the chemical weapons space. Uh, uh, we, I don't really know that much about the number, the number of people and the number of involvements. Have there been any transfers over the past year in terms of arms? The last UN report that was dealing with arms was talking about 2012 to 2017 on chemical weapons. It was released in, I believe, uh, February, March of 2018. So there were discussions then. There haven't been that much of a discussion on serious North Korean arms transfers at, in the, in the past couple of years, there have been certainly uh, more, more of the focus of the UN panel of experts is more focused on maybe what they're doing with Myanmar, what they're doing with some sub-Saharan African countries, Uganda being one and, uh, and some others. So it seems as if the UN's and the US government's focus has been on Iran and North Korea missile cooperation in 2020. Those seem to be the main areas for North Korean arms exports and, and defense cooperation. Syria seems to have dropped down a peg in terms of what we know. With respect to sourcing, I would say uh, I basically am looking at a variety of sources, obviously. So I, I know Russian, so I've been looking at uh, some Russian language sources that do deal and do research this a bit more. I've also been looking at some sources, you know, in, in, in Arabic on, uh, on this from the Syrian side. And I've done, uh, so I've, there's a lot of open source material, a lot of research and thorough readings of UN panels of experts reports and historical accounts where whatever I can find on this, cobbling this together as well as, I guess, uh, some interviews with people familiar to this in, um, in South Korea, in, uh, in the United States, in, uh, in Russia as well, because there's research on this. Yeah, so yeah, a mixture of you know, uh, open source material and some interviews, so standard methodology, I guess. Thank you very much. Uh, another question in the Q&A um, that I'll read out, read out for the audience is from uh, Benjamin Young. Uh, he asks, Syria and Iran are often intermediaries for Pyongyang in selling weapons and military assistance to non-state actors in the Middle East, such as Hamas and Hezbollah, as we've been discussing during this presentation. And he asks, given the recent tensions in the Israel-Palestinian conflict, have you seen any recent evidence of North Korea selling arms to Middle Eastern terrorist organizations? I think this speaks to an earlier discussion we were having before the webinar began about uh, North Korea's ties with Hamas and Hezbollah and to what extent that's through Iran or through other proxies. So please. Yeah, so uh, th th that's a very interesting question. I would say that uh, there are certainly weapons that Hamas and Hezbollah have in their arsenal or would want to have in their arsenal that North Korea has uh, available to them. So um, I think that a few of them that were done, there was actually an interesting study that was done by Andrea Berger on arms control research. And she itemized several things like AK-47s and ammunition, RPG-7s, Warheads, surface-to-air missiles, uh, 100 to and 240 uh, millimeter multiple rocket launchers, these type of things, and we know that these uh, equipment transfers have been continuing all the way through the 2000s, right? We know about that. We know that there were, uh, for example, a, a, a plane that was registered under uh, in Georgia at Bangkok Airport where all this happened, and this was likely headed to Iran, maybe to Hamas and Hezbollah. It was intercepted. It was captured. That's something that's quite interesting. I know even in your own work, uh, Benjamin Young, uh, you've, uh, well, which is where I've actually read a lot of this stuff and I was reading this before the webinar, which is why it's kind of on my head. You've talked about this. So uh, you've been tracking this uh, very well. Uh, with respect to uh, more recent uh, transfers, I would say uh, there really isn't any evidence of North Korea backing Hamas over the past year. There were some isolated reports of North Korean arms sales and direct negotiations with Hamas and Gaza in 2016 and 2017, but those were coming from uh, sometimes uh, polarized Arab language language media sources, and they were never confirmed really, I believe, by the UN panel of experts or by any kind of objective uh, uh, outside force. So uh, basically I think uh, there really isn't much evidence of anything that new. And I would uh, recommend uh, checking out Benjamin Yang's and Andrea Berger's work on, on this because they've done some of the best stuff. And I also recommend looking to um... Ben Young's own webinar in this series, the first of the series titled Beyond the Hermit Kingdom, North Korea and the Postcolonial World, which we had on May 12th. You can find it on the East-West Center website. 
Another question from the audience, um, has the Repub uh, from Yuviz Tobas, has the Republic of Turkey reacted to North Korean involvement in Syria? Uh, how about Canada's response? Are there any implications to these countries' responses? That's an interesting question. I would say, uh, obviously, uh, Turkey's main area of concern in Syria is, of course, uh, oh, it's really one of two areas, right? Idlib, and the second is uh, the Syrian uh, border with Turkey, where they have the safe zone with the Kurds, and where the uh, what the alleged YPG presence is, and where they're uh, they're trying to uh, and Afrin and some of those surrounding cities. So it's really more in the Kurdish areas of Rojava, which the Kurds want to turn into a federal state and a federal enclave that's right on Syria-Turkey's borders, and with the YPG presence as a threat to their security, and Idlib, where there are remnants of uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and Hayat al-Sham, and uh, now, now called that, and other uh, Sunni rebel groups where Turkey and Russia work in concert to try to patrol and protect. So those are the two key areas where Turkey is involved in Syria. North Korea's uh, involvement, as I said earlier, is more in places like Aleppo, more in places that the Assad regime has actually recaptured outright. And some of the more recent fronts where Assad has been brushing up closer to Turkey, which has really happened since 2018, 2019, the North Koreans have not really been present and there's much less evidence of them being there on the ground. So that's just one, uh, one fact that, that's there. And given that, Turkey has not paid much attention to it. So I don't think that this is a high priority for for Turkey's uh, policies. Also, Turkey has caught, as often, even when Syria uh, has carried out chemical weapons attacks, which might be helped by the North Koreans, Turkey has claimed that uh, Assad is illegitimate, he's got to be overthrown. But when it comes to uh, bearing the brunt of a NATO mission to overthrow him or taking those, that next and more decisive step, Turkey generally backs off. Operation Spring Shield in March of 2020 was as far as the Turks have gone in quite a long time. With respect to Canada, I think it's, uh, I'm Canadian myself and I haven't really seen all that much about this, but what I would say is that they just are pretty much following the uh, European and American consensus, which is kind of sanction as sad, watch for these relationships. Nothing that spectacular, but Canadian policy stands out to me. Thank you. Um, looking ahead, uh, what kind of role will North Korea play in Syria's post-conflict reconstruction? Uh, both beyond the conflict and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what kind of position is North Korea in to be providing any aid to the region at this time? Aid, supporting the reconstruction. Right, yeah, so, uh, so as I, I've already yeah, discussed a few of these dimensions. So just to, uh, to recap very briefly, um, I would say North Korea is going to be joining up with Syria in terms of an alignment in opposition to unilateral sanctions. And that's something that's very important to the North Koreans from a symbolic perspective. I mean, obviously, the North Koreans have closed ties to Cuba. They have ties to Venezuela. They have expressed solidarity back and forth with Russia over their sanctions woes, Iran and their sanctions woes. So North Korea will be a vote in the UNGA and also an on-the-ground rubber stamper of Assad's legitimacy. And there will be some more symbolic projects that will probably be done, like Kim, that Kim Il-sung Park that was constructed in 2015, or Assad visiting uh, Pyongyang. So th that is one important thing, that I ideational and normative bonding will continue and persist whether there's a civil war or not. And the fact that North Korea was so resolutely supportive of Assad will just make that bonding a whole lot stronger and revive the memories and spirit of 1973. So that's one thing that we should pay attention to. The discourse matters. It's important to keep in mind that I believe that uh, Syria has actually been the country that's exchanged the most uh, letters and, uh, uh, and correspondences with the North Korean government, according to the KCNA and some oh. South Korean observers of any other country over the past year. There were 21, I think, so far within the past uh, the, the seven or eight months. So there's a lot of exchanges at a bilateral level between North Korea and Syria. And the and even symbolic things like, you know, the Syrians, uh, even during the civil war, having years of commemoration of, uh, of Kim, Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung's birthdays, all these type of things are useful. So that, that symbolic ideational and normative commitments are really important. And more substantively in the reconstruction sphere, I would say there is North Korean guest workers, obviously in the spheres of, uh, of construction, the uh, rebuilding of vital infrastructure, obviously like the M4 and M5 highways have been facing a lot of strain due to their proximity to Idlib. So building and expanding on those, recreating uh, connectivity between the uh, Assad regime and opposition held areas if some kind of constitutional settlement is resolved will require more infrastructure projects. So that's another area where they're gonna be more involved in. The North Koreans uh, might uh, supplant uh, or, or at least complement 
in terms of guardianship responsibilities of Syria, of some maybe some Syrian oil reserves if the U.S. were to leave, or phosphate reserves, a little bit like what the Wagner Group has been entrusted with doing. But I don't know whether the Russians and the Wagner Group personnel, they might be keeping their bases, but they may not be keeping those guardianship and on the ground personnel there forever. So North Korea could take on some of those kind of roles. So that's why I see construction, guardianship, involvement and support, work with the uh, this uh, on security sector reform in a way that's purely transactional and purely about training. One of North Korea's big selling points in the uh, global South has been that it actually it doesn't just uh, export weapons, but it actually teaches other countries how to build those weapons. The Russians don't do that. The Russians have this fear of secondary arms transfers. The North Koreans can do that, have been willing to do that. They've done that in Uganda, for example. They've done that in, in during, ever since the 1990s. They've done that in, in many areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, even U.S. partners like Nigeria have worked with, uh, or at least talked about working with North Korea in that sphere. So they'll help in terms of building a defense infrastructure too. That's kind of where I see their inv their involvement in their role. So we should look at the symbolic uh, elements and the uh, these kind of certain substantive elements in in two or three senses. Thank you. I'll ask. Uh, I think maybe one last question from the from the Q and A. It's from uh, Satoru Miyamoto. This goes back to finding sources for research in this uh, in this field. Um, Satoru Miyamoto writes, it's said that North Korea dispatched their troops to Syria during the Six Days War in 1967. Is it true? Um, and uh, asking about evidence in North Korean documents. Like, how do you find proof of North Korean activities during that war? Okay, that, that's an interesting question. I would say that uh, generally there's obviously a lot more that's been written about what's happened in, uh, in 1973, right? And the uh, events of that time. Obviously, there, the North Korean anti-Israeli partnership began, uh, it predated that, right? It predated uh, the early stages of the Cold War, so it was there in, in 1967. But I, I don't really think that there's enough conclusive evidence that the North Koreans actually put troops uh, in Syria. I'd be a bit wary about making a very clear commitment over there. Also, um, uh, I think that the main cooperation between North Korea and the Arab national states in 1967 was really more with the uh, with Nasser and really more with Egypt, right? So uh, the uh, Kim uh, Il Sung and Gamal Abdel Nasser had held discussions about Mediterranean security, and they'd held discussions about uh, Israel, perhaps blockading the Straits of Tehran, the Suez, and all those areas. So the areas of cooperation that 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 North Korea was engaging most on, in an intelligence and logistical standpoint, were really more areas that were relevant to Egypt's security rather than areas that were relevant towards uh, Syrian security. The North Koreans had also ties towards Palestinian terror groups, but that again accelerated more in the early 1970s, ahead of the around the time of the Munich Olympic bombings. So there isn't all that much evidence about North Korea and Syria really cooperating and coordinating all that much in, in, in 67. If you want to look it up more, I would say there are certainly uh, some archival sources, like for example, old uh, Rodong Simun reports. So maybe we're seeing if there's anything over there. There is, is actually uh, and then the, the, I mean, the, obviously the Wilson Center Cold War archives and uh, the Hoover Institution archives and uh, anything that we can see from that. Uh, it would probably also be worth checking out some of the Soviet uh, archival material that's declassified in the Biblioteca Lenina, because a lot of information on the North Korean-Cuban relationship actually comes through from the examination of the testimonies of Soviet defectors. And that also would apply towards Syria, given the close relationship between North Korea and Syria. The Soviet archives have, have information on a lot of North Korea's partnerships in the third world. So I'd recommend maybe checking out some Soviet archives too. Yeah, those, those would be the places to check pri primarily. And, uh, but I, I don't have enough information to really give you a, a, a substantive confirmation or affirmation of, of the speculative reports on that. Well, that's terrific, thank you. And that brings us to the end of our time. Um, I want to urge all of our guests to uh, look at our North Korea in the world.org project and to sign up for the East West Center and National Committee on North Korea newsletters, to follow us on social media, and to look at our upcoming programs. Uh, the penultimate uh, webinar in this series uh, will be on August 4th. It's called uh, Exporting Revolutionary Discipline North Korea and Guyana during the Cold War. This webinar will feature Dr. Mo Taylor, who is with the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and is also a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I just wanna say on behalf of the East West Center and the National Committee on North Korea, Dr. Romani, thank you so much for your time and uh, this rich discussion. Thank you to all of our guests and uh, have a good day. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great to be here.